Alaska, America's last frontier. Five-nine prop, uh, turning base for a northwest landing. Continue approach, traffic just touching down. The tradition of flying in Alaska started with the bush pilots. Today, with about one person in every 50 holding a pilot's rating, Alaska is our flyingest state. In fact, nearly half of all the seaplanes in the world operate out of Lake Hood near Anchorage. here are professional. Many combine their work with flying. Ray Tramley is a federal game management agent. Today he's flying with Stu Miller, a flying biologist who's doing an area survey on the bald eagle. Frontier is one of the few places where the bald eagle can still be found. Nature has provided this majestic bird with remarkable eyesight. However, because of eyes on the side of its head, the eagle receives a visual picture that is flat, two-dimensional, and without perspective. To obtain a depth of vision, the eagle must constantly move its head. Thus, for the eagle, and for the pilot as well, there is more to vision than good eyesight. Although flying requires a complex combination of physical and mental skills, it all begins with the visual right, system. You take a look through here, and uh, you'll see a red dotted line. That's why the pilot's eyes get now very special attention in FAA flight, flight physicals, not just in Alaska, but throughout the rest of the nation. All right, good. Now, in this case, you'll see a sign with a checkerboard on it. Let's take a look at number one, and you tell me where uh, you see the checkerboard. Right-hand corner. All right, good. Number six, top, eight, bottom, ten, right, eleven. Uh, that's a tough one. Mm, give it a whirl. And I'll say... Uh, left. An X and a triangle. Circle. And stare straight ahead here at this white spot in the center. And when you see the other little white target coming in from the side, you say now. Mm 
Yeah. All right. A pilot must see clear, sharp images close at hand, several feet away, or in the distance. There are many similarities between a camera and the eye. Each has a lens which focuses the image on either the film or the retina. The iris of the eye corresponds to the diaphragm of a camera in admitting the proper amount of light. And as a camera's ability to take specific photographs can be improved by use of certain supplemental lenses, so too can the inadequate eye be corrected by special lenses. The miracle of sight is possible because the lens is able to focus light to form an image on the retina, which then processes that image and turns it into information which the optic nerve can transport for the brain to interpret. Among the eagle-eyed pilots are those who work for the U.S. Interior Department's Bureau of Sport Fisheries and Wildlife. Like others in the aviation community, they are deeply concerned about the survival of the bald and golden eagle. They make detailed area surveys to locate all eagle nests in order to protect the nest trees from destruction. Flying an airplane and spotting an eagle nest at 100 feet takes great skill. Therefore, they spend three full years in training, do low altitude flying only when necessary. At 6,000 through 9,000, they are 270 degrees at 7 knots. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming by, sir. Have a nice flight. Thank you. Hi, Doc. How are you? Sam, pretty good. Say, I've got to go up north here about 150 miles, and I'll be up there a couple hours. What's it look like? Well, the weather today, Doctor, is pretty good. Uh, we're still under the influence of a high-pressure system for at least another 10 hours or so. However, along your route of flight, we have mostly mid and high clouds, uh, clouds running about uh, one zero thousand broken to about two zero thousand overcast. Visibilities are unrestricted all the way. Many physicians have to fly to treat their patients, and just as the old-time country doctor had to go when called, modern flying doctors often have to do the same. Whopping big dose of penicillin. Oh, I appreciate it. And I, I want you to many. okay. And I want you to be sure and give her a lot of fluids. Yeah. And anything that she likes is all right. Sure will. And I want you to give her those tablets that I left you, and four of those a day. It's important that she have one of those tablets every six hours, round the clock. And I expect her to be doing a lot better about tomorrow. Okay. And I expect her fever to go down now. If it doesn't, I want you to get back in touch with me. I will. And I'll come on back up here. doctor's prescription for safe flying is to stay out of clouds as much as possible. Stay a thousand feet above or 500 feet below them. But sometimes a pilot has no choice and finds himself socked in. In controlled airspace, he would quickly file an instrument flight plan. In this case, he must switch to instrument flight and guard against disorientation. Even though he has corrected vision, the doctor is an eagle-eyed pilot. How's fishing today, Jack? Oh, it'd be great if we get there, but we didn't, didn't make it through. 
Uh, how are you trying to go through Merrill Pass? Yeah, yeah, I was trying to go through Merrill and it was uh, real poor. Right down on the deck, rain. You suppose a guy could get over on top? We'd sure like to get into the stony country. Well, uh, they'd be pretty high, but probably 12, 13,000. Well, maybe we'll just take our oxygen bottle and get on top and go over today. Yeah, it's beautiful on the other side. It's uh, not too bad over there, Tom. Thanks a lot, Jack. You bet. We'll see you later. In recent years, the ability of man to fly higher and higher has created the need for supplemental oxygen. Lack of sufficient oxygen at altitude can be fatal, and loss of visual acuity can be an important clue to the pilot. A pilot's time of useful consciousness without supplemental oxygen when required will vary with his altitude and his own physical condition. If his vision begins to blur, making it difficult to read instruments, it may actually be a clue to hypoxia, lack of sufficient oxygen pressure for the altitude. These effects can be even more serious at night. experts say that balanced nutrition is the best prerequisite for good vision, particularly night vision. system is tuned to make sense out of even partial information and may sometimes create illusions. For instance, we are used to seeing solid objects lighted from above, but when the lighting is different, depth and perspective change and the familiar becomes unfamiliar. When a pilot is going to fly at night, Closing one eye to the bright light will help preserve dark adaptation. In the cockpit, use red lights or turn the rheostat controlled white lights to a minimum setting. However, remember that red and yellow lines on charts will disappear under red light. Keep a small flashlight handy. It will be even more valuable in case of an instrument lighting failure. landing approach, look for visual clues. Steady runway lights usually indicate there are no obstructions between the aircraft and the light. Twinkling or disappearing lights can indicate trees or other hazards between you and the light source. Flying at night, it's wise not to look directly at objects that are poorly illuminated. Staring directly at a light may cause a dangerous illusion called autokinesis. It often happens when following a fixed external light, such as the aft light of another airplane or a distant star. If stared at for a considerable length of time, the light will seem to be moving in one direction or another. It is not, but mistaking the movement of another aircraft or taking a star for an airplane can be dangerously confusing. As in daytime flying, a constant movement of the eyes is required. Baron Enterprises. Oh, hi, Bill. How you doing? Yeah, we can have those, uh, shoot you. Pretty this pilot is a businessman. His company provides a wide range of support services for engineering oh, okay. firms. It seems okay. he's constantly on the go and in the air. Yeah, I'll be leaving about three. Uh, okay, we'll see you then. Bye.
No one would call him a problem drinker, but then he rarely goes too long without a drink. The regulations read that no person may act as a crew member of an aircraft within eight hours after consumption of any alcoholic beverage. Consumption means even one drink, because a drink at sea level is equivalent to two or three drinks at 10,000 feet. Even a small amount of alcohol in the bloodstream degrades pilot skills, and tests have proved only one ounce of alcohol causes a 20% decrease in efficiency of eye movements. Smoking also has an impact on a pilot's vision. A significant part of the smoke is carbon monoxide. When ingested, it tends to saturate part of the oxygen-carrying capacity of blood, thus impairing the body's vital oxygen supply system. In effect, smoking at an altitude of 10,000 feet can produce effects equal to 14,000 feet. Amphetamines, tranquilizers, sedatives, or any mood-changing drugs are also potential killers because they affect judgment and attention. Even APCs may be hazardous by reducing tolerance to the lower oxygen levels. The best rule regarding all drugs is not to use them prior to flight unless they have been approved by a qualified aviation medical examiner. This pilot has 20-20 eyesight but fuzzy judgment. Will it matter in this seemingly endless space? Could an accident happen here? Well, whether in Alaska or the other 49, the largest number of near mid-air incidents occur when both aircraft are operating VFR, when the only means of providing separation is see and be seen. Flying into the sun creates glare and obscures the details. Any amount of haze makes the visual job even more difficult. Plan to fly with the sun whenever possible. Going westbound, start your flying early and rest in the afternoon. Going eastbound, start late and fly until sundown. Even under ideal conditions, seeing another airplane at five miles is difficult. If two airplanes are flying toward each other at 150 miles per hour, they will meet in one minute. Therefore, if you scan only once every minute, you run the risk of a mid-air collision. It may help to set up a pattern. Each side-to-side -side pass will take about 10 seconds, including the glance at the instruments. Quartering the sky and searching all altitudes will give the best results. Practice will make the entire procedure routine in a very short time. Let's assume that while you're flying straight and level, you're suddenly confronted with the image of another aircraft. If it's well above the horizon or moving that way, it will pass above your plane, providing you remain straight and level. If it is well below the horizon, it is under you. In either case, your safest course is to hold your straight and level path. However, if you see another airplane level with your far horizon, it spells potential danger. Another very important way to tell if you are in danger of a collision involves the relative movement of the other airplane against the background. If the other airplane is definitely moving in your field of vision and keeps on doing so in any direction, you are not on a collision course. However, look out for the one that remains stationary in your field of view. If that image is holding position and growing larger rapidly, take immediate evasive action. 
When another airplane holds position, except on a parallel course to yours, turn toward his tail if he's on your right. If he's on your left, he should turn toward your tail. But he may not see you, so be prepared to initiate any maneuver that will avoid him. A good part of training yourself to see is knowing what you can't see. For example, you can't possibly see single strands of wire at a distance. So don't look for wires. Look for poles. Part of what you should see may be obstructed by things inside your airplane. Light-colored objects reflect in the windows, obscuring vision. Familiarize yourself with the route before takeoff so that you will not have to spend undue time consulting charts in the air. Also avoid the blind spots created by window posts, flight attitude, and wing configuration. Since a majority of accidents occur in the vicinity of airports, the pilot must know not only his own aircraft, but the total airspace as well, which means traffic patterns, performance of other aircraft, radio procedures, cockpit requirements, and all the necessary distractions which tend to occupy the pilot's hands, mind, and eyes. When landing at an unfamiliar airport, a safe practice is to determine the traffic pattern either by radio or by observation from above before descending and entering the pattern at the proper altitude. right down to it, the main part of seeing is really the process of seeing. When flying, the pilot processes all kinds of visual stimuli, accepting only the reliable to make accurate decisions. In fact, most of the accidents attributed to visual errors aren't really visual errors at all, but rather lack of good visual judgments. Good eyesight is only the beginning of becoming an eagle-eyed pilot. From there on, you need to develop an eagle-eyed attitude.